Okay, ni hao. Hello. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. If we could all take our seats, we'll kick off. You've made it nearly to the end of the conference, nearly to the really important session of the gala dinner later on. Uh, but before that, we've got a, a, a last great panel here that we want to take some time to, to talk about digital leadership in the automotive supply chain and in, and in China today. Um, so we got, we'll get started because we've got a great session in front of us. For those of you who, who don't know me, my name is Christopher Ludwig. I'm, I'm now the content director at Automotive Logistics. We'll talk about that a little bit later, um, about what I'm doing now. It's not so important to, uh, versus what we're, we're about to speak to. And, um, and again, we've, we've, got a, we've got a fantastic session uh, ahead of us here. Just a couple of reminders before we, we kick off. This, uh, this is the last session before we head off to the gala dinner hosted by our, our premier sponsor, Changju Logistics. It's at uh, the Dao Miao Hot Pot. It's a very traditional Chengdu um, restaurant serving Chengdu Hot Pot. And um, you know, we're going to have some buses and some guides which will take us there pretty much directly after this session. There'll be coaches, there'll be buses downstairs. So please do join us for that. A little bit of warning for those of you not from Sichuan province. This is quite spicy food, so come prepared. Uh, come prepared for that, but it is definitely delicious. Um, a couple of you have also been asking about the, the pandas that our team are wearing. Now, hopefully, most of you already got one. There are plenty at the registration desk. If you didn't get a panda, you don't have to go all the way to the sanctuary. They usually don't let them out of there. So do, do go to the, to the reg desk and, and get yourself a panda and, and, and wear it here, because obviously we are proud to be representing uh, Chengdu here and it's part of the, the local culture. OK, um, again. We're going to be talking about digital leadership, digitalization uh, in the supply chain. I think the narrative in, in China and this conference, if we look back over the, over the past years, we, we focused almost exclusively on, on growth and capacity and volume and, and sort of scale. Uh, and then a few years ago, we started to, to talk to go from you know, quantity to quality, improving standards, uh, building up professional services, um, um, basically, you know, modeling more maybe standards we'd see in Europe or North America. And I think China closed the gap very quickly on, on, on all of those. I mean, there's still, there's still a ways to, to go, as, as we know, and we talk about different regulations, 1589, and other things that are still, still going, the development of multimodal. Uh, not to say that it's perfect, but, but in, in many ways, the Chinese logistics market, uh, from a cost basis, from a quality basis, um, has, doesn't, it isn't so far off what we would see in other markets. So um, there's been a big, big jump there. And certainly now, I think we're, we're really talking about digital and connected supply chains and, and logistics. And I think China is such an interesting context because it's not just a digital economy. China is a digital society. I mean, you just, you just have to look at how many of you are actually staring at your smartphone instead of, instead of listening to me right now, you know, just to kind of show that. I mean, I don't blame you either. It's much more interesting on WeChat. But um, uh, whether it's e-commerce or, 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 or ride sharing or, or, food, or food order delivery, by I mean, in China, the uptake on digital services has just been tremendous. And, and it's outpaced many other markets, outpaced the US in many ways, outpaced many parts of Europe. And, and we, we see this converging as well in the automotive space. Um, I think Matt Sarbon spoke uh, just in the last session about how we, you know, we still are used to talk about low, middle, and, and, and sort of premium segments and, or, or high tech segments. And this is kind of disappearing as we see the, the models that are, that are coming out. The automotive industry is becoming a pretty much a purely high-tech industry. Cars are connected. Cars are digitally connected. We're moving into autonomous. We're, we're looking extensively at AI and, and, and other kind of impacts. If you look at the, the new Chinese car makers, which are trying to break out into the world, whether it's Byton or Neo or, or the latest models from, from other, other, other brands, these are really high-tech high -tech machines and, 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 and looking to jump, jump ahead of what we see in many other places. So, so this, and the electrification that we've heard about as well today, um, in terms of China already being the biggest market for that and only set to grow with regulations and the production happening here. So this is, this is already, a, 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 like I said, a digital society and it's a digital automotive industry. And in logistics as well, this is, this is a digital, this is already in many ways, increasingly, a digital sector whether it's using cloud, cloud-based services, or cloud warehouses, or, or other, other advances in, in automation, uh, and in telecommunications, and in, and in visibility. Uh, I've, again, if we look back from five, six, seven years ago, the, the jump is incredible. Um, we're, we're, not, we're not 
we're not necessarily talking about catching up. Um, we're seeing many cases where, we're, where we've jumped ahead of, of many other parts of the world. So when we come on to a topic like digital leadership, I think it's, it's, it's interesting because uh, today in China, a digital leader needs to kind of think on two planes. On the one hand, there's this future vision of, a, of, of fully autonomous and, and fully digitally connected and, and a completely re revolution in the way the whole automotive industry may work if you believe all the hype around autonomy and, and around shared ownership. And, and I do, frankly, in many, many parts of, 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 of countries and urban societies, I do think this change will come. And, and that will clearly have big impacts on, on this industry as well and on the supply chain, whether it's the locations, whether it's the technology, whether it's the processes and the very services that we offer. Um, so as a digital leader, you kind of have to be thinking ahead and, and understanding and trying to guess and, and anticipate and invest and move ahead of some of these changes, which, which are happening, rap happening rapidly, but, uh, but are nev nevertheless not necessarily transparent in when they will, when they will impact us. And at the same time, obviously, there are so many digital tools increasingly available right at our fingertips today. Uh, again, whether we're talking about mobile apps that, that allow you to view your inventory, or, or, or again, the cloud services which help, help improve visibility across the supply chain. Uh, these may not be um, you know, the revolution yet, but they make a big impact, and, and, and I think a lot of companies uh, still have a long way to go and still have a lot of opportunity to, um, to make improvements in those areas. So that's a little bit the context of this session, and we've got some speakers who can, I think, address this from, from a, a number of kind of interesting angles, including a number of tier suppliers here in China, global suppliers, but, but, but obviously based here in China, who can, who can give us perspective on how they are digitalizing aspects of their logistics and their supply chain, and maybe what some of these future changes could mean for their business models, could mean for, for you as service providers or competitors or partners. Um, and, and then we also have another perspective from, uh, from an e-commerce player as well in, in, in human technology. So, so again, we, we're going to get another chance to sort of look across a few different aspects of digital logistics, digital supply chains, and, and again, we'll, we'll, we'll have some Q&A time as well to, to continue there. So we'll have presentations from each of our uh, presenters. Let me introduce them to you now. We're first going to hear from Mark Zhuo, who's the logistics uh, manager at Federal Mogul China. Thank you, Mark. Mark will then be followed by Benedict Berner, who's the Director of Regional Network Design and Transportation at Schaeffler here in Greater China. And last but, last, but, but not least, we'll hear from Wang Jingyu, the VP of Sales of Yemen Technology. So we'll talk more about each of those presenters as they come up, but now I'd like to hand the stage over to Mark um, from Federal Mogul. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I think that those who can stay here up until now are really true lovers of this session. Uh, early this morning and also this afternoon, we have heard a lot of presentations from different perspectives. And my part will be a little bit more personal and individual oriented, which is about how supply chain professionals can develop the skills in a digital era. A few words about myself. My name is Mark Zhuo, coming from Federal Mogul, China. Ever since year 2008, uh, I started to work in this industry, and before that, I was working in the ICT industry or telecommunicative industry. So, this is the content of my speech. First of all, how digital era will affect us. Secondly, what do we need to learn? Thirdly, how to develop those skill sets. In terms of its influence of the digital era, yesterday we found that when I was checking in in the hotel, there were two ladies uh, in front of me, ahead of me. Uh, the room fee has already been paid, prepaid, but the hotel uh, really asked them to uh, have a so-called deposit receipt for guarantee. However, these two ladies uh, didn't bring with them enough cash or credit cards. So what can they do? I found that, well, they have a trouble. So I gave them around 200 RMB yuan, and they have uh, transferred the money back to me through WeChat. So it, it, indeed, we are really surrounded by digitalization. 
and indeed we are really ahead of uh, many other countries in terms of uh, digital way of payment. Indeed, the digital era is really affecting all of us. From the management professionals, what can we uh, learn from this era? So I want to view this issue from the four trends. First of all, volatile market or market volatilities. This morning we mentioned some China-America frictions of trade. No matter whether it is uh, five, uh, 50 billion yuan or 500 billion um, US dollars uh, trade surplus or deficit, very likely it will give some impacts to our industry. If you take a look at the niche markets, it is the national strategy to develop uh, electric vehicles. The traditional OEMs are trying their very best to move into the electric vehicle businesses. Some internet companies are uh, are showing very strong interest in uh, manufacturing electric vehicles. From consumers' point of view, the uh, the the post 1980s and post 1990s generations are the mainstay of the Chinese consumers. They're distinctive uh, from, or they're different from the previous generations of consumers. Um, they, they have changing demands. They're volatile and. If I take a look at the uh, automobiles, parts, uh, industries, some companies are making investment and some companies are doing the divestment, mergers and acquisitions are commonly uh, seen. On the other hand, some companies are trying to peel off the non-core business. There are numerous examples of that nature in this market. And some companies are, are forced to make internal uh, changes because of the uh, external pressure. I, I used to work with uh, Shanghai Bell. It was, uh, the, the company was established in the 1980s. In 2002, Alcatel, which uh, was a French company, merged with uh, Bell, Shanghai Bell, and in 2005, uh, it merged with uh, Lucent, a U.S. company. It just recently, uh, Lucent Alcatel merged with Nokia. So I renewed my uh, CV. I worked with Nokia, Shanghai Bell. Alcatel. Uh, you might, you might, you might think that uh, I have a very strong CV. I worked in all these four giant companies, but that is not the case, because they merged with each other. Also, there are a lot of internal uh, changes. Uh, because of the rising labor cost, we have to relocate to the area where the labor cost is relatively lower. And sometimes uh, the companies uh, allow the entire sales team to carry out their work at home base to reduce the uh, office cost. Some of the uh, low-end jobs in the logistic industries will be eliminated thanks to artificial intelligence. It is going to happen in the near future. Let's take a look at the complex consumer uh, customer's request. The on-time de delivery is always high on the list of the customer's demand and the reduction of the transportation and logistic cost is something urgently needed by the customers. So uh, the volatile market, changing organizations and complex requests or requirements from the customers. Well, they're put together to create a very vague future for uh, the professional managers. 
Have you heard about this word VUCA? Anyone? By show of hand, if you have heard about this word. When your training courses talked a lot about VUCA. Because it truly reflects the uh, psychological status of the professional managers. They are in a constant state of anxiety. Anxiety is not necessarily a bad thing. It pushes you out of your comfort zone. It forces you to continue to learn, continue to do physical exercises. So for logistic managers, what do you need to learn? To extend your uh, business skills. So end-to-end -end learning is very important in the logistic industry. Supply chain itself is a uh, comprehensive uh, system from the uh, front end demand to the uh, back end supply to logistic management to the emergence of new technologies. So it, it won't be suffice to just read a couple of uh, articles or to attend uh, some conferences or seminars. You need to have a global picture. Fragmented uh, learning has a uh, intrinsic problem. That is the 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 the, the conversion rate of knowledge into action is pretty low. Let's say you have uh, 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, it's not likely that you will draw a book out of your pocket to read a, read a couple of pages. But instead, you will uh, take a mobile phone and browse a couple of pages on the website. Uh, it's not going to be very useful for your career development. So through end to end learning, it will systematically enhance your cognitive capability. So what kind of soft skill do we need as a logistic manager or supply chain manager? One of my friends conducted a small-scale survey on 261 professionals on uh, the career skills that they need in their job. 68% uh, of the respondents from tier one cities, 74% of the respondents are below the age of 40, so they're relatively young. Talking about the program language, I think Python is uh, very popular. The uh, user interface is pretty is pretty friendly, and therefore it is favored by uh, most of these professionals. Uh, soft skills like uh, like management, uh, public speech. I won't go into details one by one. I hope that this kind of survey is enlightening. The third thing we need to learn about is social media. Of course, you need to have some sort of internet thinking. But the internet companies, especially those who are interested in building uh, electric vehicles, they talk a lot about internet thinking. They're talking about internet thinking to differentiate themselves from traditional car manufacturers. They focus on customer experience. They center. They, they do everything around the uh, needs and demands of the customers, especially the individualized demands of the customers. The operation, on, the operation of the new media and social media is also very important um, by the operation of uh, new media. It's, it's more than putting uh, some sort of propaganda articles on, on, on the website. It, re it requires very careful uh, offline planning, online investigation, uh, target customer 
identification and the launch of appropriate content for each and every individual customers, for any uh, internet startups. This is something they need to focus on. Our uh, third party and fourth party logistics suppliers, they need to understand how to provide better services and high quality services for their customers. So how to develop your skills? We need to learn, of course. End-to-end -end learning. Uh, Apex is probably the most authoritative uh, knowledge supplier in the logistic industry. I launched a CSCP pro probably 10 years ago. In 2015, it acquired Supply Chain Council, so they started to use Scopy. It's done from Austria. It launched CITD. So if you want to learn something about the logistic uh, systematically, I recommend uh, Apex. As to how to put the knowledge into practice, I would say the logistic is for supply chain management. Is a very uh, practice-oriented uh, business. I, I, I do believe that uh, the, the best practices in China uh, will be enjoying its leadership in a worldwide context pretty soon. A recap of my presentation, first of all, uh, how digital era affects us. So VUCA is the four key letters. And what do we need to learn? And to end supply chain knowledge is something we need to learn. Uh, we need to have some programming capabilities. And also, we need to have some soft skills. And the third topic I covered is how to develop. You need to put what you have learned into practice. There's nothing very special about uh, supply chain management. You have to you have to try different uh, methods to see whether this one works or not. And then you go back to theory and try to make improvement and put it into practice again. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mark. I think there's a lot of very important points there. And I mean, obviously, there's many technical aspects uh, of digitalization around coding, around AI, and all the, the high tech aspects. But I think you brought home the, the soft skills that are important, the training, and the, the, the sort of mindset that needs to needs to change, and I suppose a digital leader needs to be able to, to help this, his team, his or her team transition uh, and move with these times. So I, I think those were some really good and interesting points to, to kind of kick us off. Um, interesting as well to hear about the, the journey of your CV through mergers and acquisitions, and I guess it's going to take another, another interesting step there as you'll add another uh, corporation to your title next year, I guess, with Tonoco and Federal Mogul becomes part of a larger group. So that, that impact of, of digitalization is, is still happening in other ways there too. Of course, with Tonoco buying Federal Mogul and, and, and changing um, as part of, uh, is also a big reaction to digitalization and the supply chain and the different directions of technology and stuff. So um, moving along, let's uh, now I'd like to invite Benedict Berner from Schaefer, uh, Schaefer Group in Greater China. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm very happy to be here on behalf of uh, the Scheffler Group here in China, uh, where I'm taking care on the network design and transportation for the regional transpo uh, transport logistics. And I would like to introduce to you today uh, iChain, or how Scheffler think, or what Scheffler thinks digitalization within the supply chain and logistic uh, is needed. So and therefore, I will talk with you about the complexity of our situation currently in the supply chain. I will talk with you about the complexity in uh, transport logistics. And then finally, uh, I will come to the concept of iGen and how we actually realize this in uh, greater China for the organization. 
And I would like to start with a picture of uh, Lucas Di Grassi. Um, as you can see, he's uh, sponsored by Scheffler. Um, he's a Formula E race driver, and last year he won the Formula E championship. And uh, the pictures were with him celebrating uh, with bottles of champagne went around the world. Um, but actually, behind the success that everyone can see and in front of the stage, there is more to it. There's actually a big team to it. Yeah? And this uh, big team, uh, they are very well aligned and everyone in this team has uh, one part to play. And this team is monitoring a race during all the time because they have a steering cockpit. They have all information available. Um, they're looking at the analytics of the race car itself. They're looking at when does the car need a maintenance? When do we need to stop? What does have to happen? And because they have the steering cockpit and they have all information available in one place, they are able to make decisions very fast and they are able to allocate resources very fast and efficiently. So if you look into transport logistics, what we see is mostly uh, something like Lucas Di Grassi on the stage. We see a relation from A to B, but uh, if you look a little bit deeper, uh, into these relations, actually uh, a company, a global manufacturing company has a lot of these relations and uh, this uh, black lines are actually one snapshot of our global network of all our transport lanes uh, we had in 2017. And to make it a little bit more complex, all these transport lanes, they have different parts again. We have uh, different service providers involved that are moving the goods on these lanes. Also, we have different equipment that is needed because we have different products. We need uh, pallets. Sometimes we have project cargo or dangerous goods that we are moving. Then we have different steering methodologies behind it. Yeah? We have make-to-stock orders. We have make-to-orders. Um, so different triggers that actually cause these movements. And finally, we, in the end of the day, we have different products that we are moving, yeah? from raw material to finished goods. So overall, transportation itself is, is very complex in itself. So to have a look at the products that we are moving here, um, they are ranging from automotive systems, where we also see a change towards e-mobility, so we're not talking about products anymore with five components, we're talking about e-mobility systems with uh, 120 components. And these components, they're coming from all over the world, and they have to be uh, organized. Um, but we're also talking about industrial large size bearings, which can be uh, larger than 18 meters in diameter. And then we also have aftermarket products that uh, have to be uh, put together in kitting operations according to customer requirements. So overall, to give you a picture, Scheffler has more than 10,000 of these different kind of products. And these 10,000 products are being produced in more than 75 plants worldwide. And doing so, we consumed actually 1.1 million tons of steel in uh, 2017. So what does this mean for transportation? For us, it means we are moving 3 million shipments every year globally to customers and to our plants. Um, we're having more than 100 logistic service provider, which is a complexity in itself. And in, in uh, terms of uh, volumes, we are moving around 22,000 boxes around the world, but we also have 25,000 tons of air freight which makes us a uh, rather large player in this industry. So the transport function by itself also has some influence that, uh, influences that it has to deal with. So uh, on the one hand, we have our customer, our customer has certain requirements to deliveries. Um, we have the economy and market that has a uh, highly impact to our operations. Uh, we saw it last year, for example, in the ocean freight market when the carriers consolidated to alliances, which had a uh, heavy impact to the pricing levels of the company. Then we have our internal stakeholders. We have different functions, production and supply chain management uh, and purchasing. They also have their own targets and uh, company goals and KPIs. And in the end of the day, we have the company targets that we have to fulfill yeah, and which give us the budgets that we can work with. So what can we do in transportation to do this? Actually, we have some wheels we can turn to respond to all these requirements. We have different services that we can use, uh, which also come at different cost levels. We can redesign our global logistics network, um, our logistics footprint there to uh, get it cost optimized. We can have different processes, but we can also have different service providers that can provide different service levels in the end of the day. 
So if you look not only into transportation, then we look into the overall supply chain. Um, and as you all know, it's, it's rather more complex again because we have much more of these partners in the supply chain. And we have uh, many, let's say, checks installed in the supply chain and steering components, how we want to make sure that we balance out the volumes within the supply chain. We check on our suppliers if they can deliver. We can, we can check our internal capacities yeah, against the monthly sales forecast. But overall, the supply chain itself is, is pretty much steered anon anonymously. So none of these activities are actually linked to a real customer order because all these uh, partners within the supply chain, they optimize themselves again because uh, they are driven by individual targets. So what happens then, there's a lot that can happen. Yeah? So on the one hand there, we can have shortages from suppliers on purchase goods, or we have uh, production delays because some machines break down and uh, no one has the information about this, maybe on the other side of the world. Um, we can have transport delays, or we can have uh, just a shortage on finished goods in our warehouses, and then we have to prioritize uh, which customer to serve. And this is very difficult, and uh, this ends in escalation meetings, where mostly someone makes decisions in his escalations based on his experience, but uh, not because he really has all information available to make a really good decision. And mostly, or in many cases, in the end of the day, we are trying to solve it with the most expensive transport mode, which is air freight, yeah, to still somehow satisfy the customer demand or somehow get the machines running again. So what can we do, or what is our idea how we can fix this? So we believe we have to get visibility within the supply chain and we have to get control within the supply chain. And uh, what we want to achieve, the principle that has to be achieved is, we have to be able to have a correct status information of a customer order within our supply chain at any time. And how we think we uh, can achieve this, uh, we have to set milest milestones uh, in our, uh, we call it also pulse points that we have to send. And these pulse points within the supply chain, um, they have to be met and they are being monitored uh, in a steering cockpit more or less. Um, and if they're not hit on time, uh, a customer order will go on delay or we will uh, get a report about an issue because we want to know the issues as early as possible to react on it. And how, how do we do this? So we have to lift up this information that we have in all partners in the supply chain available from an operational level into an analytical level, on a data level. And this is where we see the potential for digitalization and the digital technologies that are out there. And with doing this, we are actually able to compare at any time the actual status of a customer order with the planned supply chain that uh, was in before. And to drive these digital initiatives, um, we think we have to break it down in three parts. We, we have to look into the operations that are going on, we have to look into our systems that we're having in a company, and we have to look uh, into the skill sets, uh, like Mark already mentioned, yeah, um, that are actually needed for this new uh, brave world. And I would like to introduce you now how we transfer this in our transport logistics in Greater China. So starting first, similar to the racing team, you also have to build a, a central team in logistics. So therefore, we build a logistics control tower, we call it. So we bundled all uh, activities for logistics here in Greater China within one team, which gives you the uh, reduced supply chain cost, uh, reduced transaction cost because you have it bundled. But uh, this logistics control tower um, also connects the strategic supply chain planning with the dynamic optimization in the everyday work of a specialist there when he ships out the shipments. This logistics control tower also has uh, budget control. So this means uh, because they have the control, they can also make cost de decisions if needed. And we see this as a, a basic step towards here yeah, to any kind of digital initiatives here yeah, to have all activities in one place and all processes standardized. So the next step after we installed this uh, logistics control tower, we were looking on our inbound sea freight because we had uh, highly delayed uh, situations in 2016. So what we actually did, we installed along the cargo flow these pulse points, uh, the major milestones that have to be hit at any time, where we would have to make decisions within the supply chain if they are delayed. And to enable to get this information, we connected our existing service providers. Um, we established a data flow of our existing service providers. But in addition, we use a service provider who is specialized on the tracking and tracing of global sea freight containers. So putting these information together into one place um, gives us the control, first of all, to have this information in our data cloud, in, in our company cloud. But of course, we can also go online and we can see any time the status of a container of a shipment 
in the uh, supplier's dashboard, online dashboard. So having this installed and getting the visibility with our, within our transport chain, we are now actually able to uh, execute a risk management. And risk management means yeah, we have to define contingency plans that are being executed yeah, after decisions are being made. So how does it work, for example, if you have a delay in Germany uh, where our containers are being consolidated in an overseas consolidation center and we get an, an, a report, an issue, uh, we actually can make the decision to utilize maybe a faster vessel or we can put a container on a railway uh, to still hit the expected delivery dates in China to keep the production running or to serve the customer as planned according to our supply chain. So coming to the system part, so similar to the racing team, we also had to develop our central steering cockpit, our dashboard, where we, uh, where we can look at all this data that we are collecting. And we did this, we created a uh, web dashboard uh, internally for the company, but we also developed a mobile phone application uh, that can be used uh, remotely uh, and doesn't have to be linked to the workplace. So for the data architecture, we put the data, data architecture together in a plug and play network. This means uh, we are very easy, we can uh, select new service providers and we can connect these new service providers to our existing data architecture. Um, the user internally, for example, a factory planner, a material planner, he can use the mobile phone application. And because we add additional uh, information from our ERP system to this uh, shipment data, we are actually able to offer uh, tracking and tracing on a material level. So a, a factory planner, material planner can go uh, to the mobile application and can track his material because this is the decision or this is the information he needs to make adjustments in his production. Um, going one step further, talking about digital trends, uh, so of course having all this data in one place and identifying pattern in our shipment behavior, we are actually able then in the next step to use machine learning or artificial intelligence to make the decision automatically by the system and not by the people anymore because decisions by people are connected to emotions. Um, there are still emotions there if you have to order an air freight there because maybe something went wrong uh, on someone's fault and uh, we think we can do a better job in there. So adding to the skills, uh, Mark already mentioned, um, uh, I think there are some things here that have to be considered when we talk about digital projects because digitization in a company is a more long-term strategy that is needed. And companies, if they want to follow up on these projects, they have to prepare dedicated budgets. And these budgets are limited because mostly these digital projects, they are not directly reducing the cost or they are not directly reducing the lead time, but they give you more control or they give you more visibility on your operations. So one skill that we see is needed in project teams, they have to be able to make business cases, uh, similar like startup pitch decks, yeah, to actually convince the senior management to dedicate a budget to their projects and then keep it going in the first place. Um, in the next step, the project teams, they have to learn lean startup methodologies. They have to learn to build minimum viable products. Uh, so the, the product results that has to be achieved in a, in a minimum quality setup, but putting these results directly into operation and getting feedback from the customer, from the user, and then uh, putting this feedback back into an improvement uh, cycle. This is something uh, that uh, is different from the traditional project management where we mostly have a very long planning. We try to globally, uh, globally align every project, but um, in the end there, yeah, um, we fail to deliver the final result. We also see uh, that not all skills are always available within the company. So open innovation is definitely one part. And uh, according to the statistics, every day in China, there are more than 12,000 startups being created. So, and uh, we think that uh, the traditional companies, global companies, can use this uh, dynamics from startups and the agility and maybe also sometimes the technology to get an advantage yeah, and get to get these missing skills into the company. And then um, also, as we heard already before, we see the professional job description of a logistics expert changing. So uh, now we're not just looking anymore for a specialist who could execute shipments. We're looking for someone who can uh, analyze data, who can uh, design networks, who can uh, program databases. And this is very difficult to find because there's a war, war on talents going on, uh, similar to the war on talents on experts for artificial intelligence. And this also have a heavy burden on HR budgets as well in the company. So going forward, um, we saw already the benefits we can have in transportation and now it's time actually uh, to, to expand the whole concept and uh, also to put down this pulse point methodologies here in the other functions 
and, and after we get the total visibility of our overall supply chain, um, we believe we finally we can remove these individual silos, so there's no more individual targets and steering, and then ultimately we can create a, a value chain throughout the company where we can offer flexible standards at any time, and we can synchronize the supply chain according to the real customer needs or according to the decisions that have to be made. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benedict. I think this is, again, a, a great example, great case study in, in how uh, a tier supplier, in this case, is, is looking at, at various digital, digital innovations and solutions to, to, to improve operations here in China, to, um, to, to, to leverage some of the, the skills and, 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 and tech um, startups and, 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 and uh, things that are developing out here. So a lot of interesting uh, detail there, a lot of, a lot of ideas, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure that would be interesting to all of you as well. So there we've had a couple of perspectives from the tier supply chain, as, as, as mentioned. And uh, now uh, we're going to kind of change gears a little bit uh, back, a little bit to the e-commerce side, which of course is such an important aspect of uh, the digital supply chain and, and certainly one, as we saw in our last session, which is uh, particularly of great interest to, to this audience as well for what we can learn and, and understand about uh, the e-commerce side. Pleased to welcome uh, Wang Ji Yu from Yemen Technology. Well, yesterday I had a sore throat, so probably uh, I'm sorry for the sore throat today uh, because my voice might not be that so nice to hear. Uh, first of all, who is Ye Ming about ourselves? Around 13 years ago, we provide uh, professional data services and analytical services to uh, ICBC in China. Out of the past three years, we collaborated with the auto companies. And we worked a lot with the internet companies to establish the current uh, Yeming uh, tech company. Uh, in the past, we normally say uh, data is really useful, but what can we do about data? Even if you have a huge amount of data, probably you don't know how we can do about this data and what type of effective uh, use can we generate from the application of the data. So these are the areas in which I want to dwell upon. I want to say a few words about RFID's application of uh, data assets for the company. So what appears on the screen are very common, uh, which is what we call the turnover uh, products, turnover-related products like a standardized containers, normal boxes, normal RFD tags, metal boxes, and many others. So using different types of labels, the data we collected through these means can be endowed or assigned with new functions. And these new functions will determine how intelligent it can be in real life. Uh, for example, the portal applications for the conveyors, no matter where you use it, on the forklift, uh, the entire process is highly intelligence-based to the total uh, independence from human labor. So RFID is really uh, capable of doing everything, including data collection. This is a case study. Uh, I want to go through this case very quickly. We know that Shenfeng is really a typical example in the express delivery services industry. So what we really care most is about the after-sales services, right? The third part is the omnipotent all position or all directional uh, tracking capabilities of our automotive OBD system. So what appears on the screen now is what Changzhou Group has already uh, shared with you. 
So when they ship their cars to Europe, this is the uh, monitoring process of the, uh, the of vehicle transportation. The black box at the very center is on the rack. It is not mounted to the vehicle. So the advantage of doing so is when the car is transported through sea, through water, through multimodal transportation to Russia or to European countries, then we can have uh, all process uh, monitoring or tracking capabilities, including collecting all the data before we can form the real big data. So many cars have been mounted with the GPS facilities, and uh, we have also a lot of uh, GPS uh, accessories. So what is the big problem of uh, GPS? It can be mounted to almost all facilities, but that your system does not know necessarily understand whether it is a really a true system or not. The OBD can really uh, uh, have a mutual recognition of the only one VIN number of each vehicle. In other words, it can really help you to uh, check whether uh, the system can really work specifically for this car instead of for that car or other cars. The fourth part is about our mesh. According to my knowledge, we are still uh, the only one player in mesh in China so far. Uh, for mesh, actually, there are only two players. One is in Israel. The second one is in Yemin Keji, or our company. So when your cars are in transportation on the sea, you want very much to know what happened to the vehicles. But given the current uh, network system, it is difficult for you to uh, talk to the vehicles in transportation. So mesh can do it. The biggest advantage of mesh system is for its dialogue with itself. For example, give you a very example, a simple example. If we can have a dialogue system or network between all the mobile phones here on the screen or in the conference room, so theoretically, whenever we set up a so-called app or a program, we don't have to exchange business cards with each other. It can do it automatically across the board in the whole conference room. The fifth part is called the uh, AI cloud data processing platform. Probably this is the part that you all care most, given so much expertise for data collection. But at the end of the day, what can we do about the anal analysis of the, uh, of the data? What can we do about the data? Uh, this is a quick summary of uh, what we have done so far. RFID is no strange to you. RFID label is what we call an individual-based Internet of Things. It can be mounted to almost anywhere. So as you can type in the key figures, and you can get the RFID, and this RFID can tell you that this it this is it. It is instead of some other things. Second stage is OBD. OBD is the so-called uh, two people based dialogue based upon trust. So first of all, first and foremost, we have to build a trust between two people. The third layer is mesh called group or cluster dialogue. Uh, it can ensure mutual recognition, mutual dialogue, and a mutual connection, and a mutual appreciation to establish mutual trust. Uh, this is the third layer. Probably you know not too much about this Internet of Things, but the per first three layers uh, hopefully can really simplify what we learn about the Internet of Things, that is the connection between different things. So whether or not there can be trust or mutual trust among all these things is a very big issue. Bef only based upon which can we uh, ensure uh, the learning capabilities little by little. This is the very basis or the very directions for the future development of AI. <coughs> Uh, prior to the first industrial revolution, almost all the tools have to depend upon human labor and for depend on uh, animal labor. So a very important thing for the first industrial revolution is to develop uh, steam engines, discover the oils, and power. 
So we can do whatever we want using these uh, new discoveries. Uh, we sh are sure that the second industrial revolution will be characteristic of data collection and the key evidence or contribution to AI. Uh, just now, the speakers before me have all mentioned that the AI development or AI market may need a lot of robots. But does not, whether or not it means that it will take the jobs from many people, I'm also quite interested in whether I will be laid off in the future. So having conducted a thorough study in this connection, I found that Actually, uh, each and every one of us is not working in full, division, uh, full efficiency. For example, do you want to drink coffee? Do you want to? Uh, do you really love arts? Do you want to do a lot of researches? So, maybe all these are quite uh, vague questions or vague questionings. Actually, what we human beings really like are those issues that are not likely to be the most highly efficient. We would like to do some low efficient things. So for those highly efficient things, why not we leave those things to the robots? We can let the robots learn many things and then we can really devise a program helping those robots to learn to master all the uh, knowledges much more quickly. So as we can embrace the AI era, can we know more about what we can do about the details? And that's why in the supply chain, chain era, there are very few AI facilities. Why? Because we don't think they are useful. But for most of the time, they are in the areas in which we can do much better. However, as I said, there could be more differentiations between human labor and a robot labor or AI labor. I think it is proper and it is advisable for us to do more things for some mutual recognition. So it is in this connection I think that the Internet of Things will play a bigger role. This can help us to identify a bright future for a quick breakthrough. In the next 20 years, actually this is our forecast, in the next 20 years, we forecast that there will be three stages. During the first stage, uh, the Internet will become s smarter, undoubtedly through uh, the innovations and connections between uh, data and physical assets, uh, new innovation will be generated. At the second stage, we're going to launch a uh, second round of uh, industrial revolution. Uh, revolutions. You might have a lot of data and statistics, and these data is uh, very valuable because in the future, probably I have to pay for this data. I want to establish an AI, and I, I need data to see if the uh, AI is feasible or not. I need to buy this data from you. And your data uh, will be able to uh, turn into something that can drive the second round of industrial revolution. Once we turn uh, on the third stage, we can turn the Internet of Things into robots. So all those uh, sort of efficiency things can be left for the robots. So what do we do? What do we human do? Well, the, the deep blue uh, defeated the, uh, the champion, the international champion of, of, of the international chess, but uh, the, the champions the international champion of the international chess is still working uh, with uh, the AI on, on further strategic development. I think we need to embrace a brighter future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Wang, first of all, for 
for, for suffering through with, with the, as you mentioned, a sore throat. I think that didn't seem to stop you at all. And uh, even if in the future a robot might not get a sore throat, I, I don't believe a robot could have done anywhere as good a job as you, as you have just done there. So thank you again for that. And thank you for laying out uh, a really interesting vision or forecast, or and, and in some cases even already reality of, of, of what a digital supply chain uh, will increasingly look like in terms of the, the different layers, uh, in terms of AI and mesh and, and, and the areas you looked at. Again, um, this, this is going to have a big impact on, on, on what, what many in the industry do. So it's, uh, it's, these are great to, to kind of have these discussions. And it's interesting how much of it, of course, also comes back to human talent, whether that's fear over what's going to happen to our jobs. But nevertheless, it, it definitely comes, comes, comes back to how we adapt and, and how we understand how to make the most of these technologies and how to, how to live with them as well. And we do have uh, plenty of time now for Q&A, and we, we, we do want to take advantage of it. Again, I, I, as, as Louis mentioned before, um, it's not asking questions isn't a quick route to a beer, I'm afraid, um, at, at the gala dinner. You know, we can't necessarily start that earlier. So let's take advantage of, of the time we have with our panel, and uh, we'll have some, we have some microphones going around. So if anybody from the audience has any questions to start off, um, please put your name up and hands and say your... Um, Name a company as per usual, but I'll 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 start. Um, I guess it's, it's to the panel in general, but but we can start maybe with the, one of the tier suppliers. Um, you know, how, how as a division, as a department, as a company, do you do you decide on on your sort of investment resources on some of these digital technologies? Because it's an industry which typically wants pretty quick. ROIs, pretty fast return on investment, um, but not all of the technologies necessarily are, are mature or, and they're changing so fast. So what are the, some of the internal processes perhaps and decisions that are made to, to give yourself the room to, to try, but, but also you know, to, to not spend your whole budget basically every year on, on changing technology? So maybe Benedict, can start with you? Yeah, I can start with this. Um, <coughs> So at Scheffler, globally, there's a, a budget set for digitalization, uh, as we also have a partnership with IBM. And uh, there are some rules that are being set by the company. For example, that uh, if you want to go for a digital uh, project uh, or you have some idea you would like to test and implement, um, it has to show a return on investment within one year. So uh, there has to be some impact, either to cost, uh, to quality, or delivery. Um, and this is the, the basic rules that are being set there. As, as I mentioned before, many of the projects, it's actually difficult to prove this value and directly show this cost impact yeah, and how it's going to save cost. Because what we saw from experience so far, um, we get a better visibility on our supply chain. And it's really about this decision making that then can, in the next step, possibly save cost. Yeah? We're choosing the right transportation mode there. Yeah, um, maybe not wasting resources on, on the processes that can be done otherwise. Mm. So this is some of the, the rules that the company set. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mark, you give me perspective from Federal Mogul? Uh, my company uses an ERP system in North America. We've been using this ERP system for, for long, and uh, we haven't maintained and upgraded for long. So this year we decided to launch a new ERP system for a North America company. According to my knowledge, it is a cloud-based ERP system. But it's quite an innovative idea. I, I haven't uh, had any contact with this kind of uh, uh, platforms so far, and I think it is a future development trend. Is there, I mean, is there, is there any specific plans to look and, and renew or maybe follow this model once uh, it's kind of up and, and running and successful? Uh, mainly it's... Uh, Maybe we have uh, implement in, in the states for headquarters first. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, but Mr. Mr. Wang, maybe do you have any comment on on on, on those processes? I mean, is is one year ROI as a kind of rule too much of a limiting factor as we move towards uh, towards some of these these changes ahead and, <coughs> and some of the kind of more radical technology we might be we might be talking about for anybody to comment really. I stumped them. Well, <clears throat> from my point of view, 
I think there is uh, or there are a lot of uh, digital trends. Uh, for example, blockchain is one of the, the key trends that we're seeing more and more in the news and now also in logistics. And I believe many companies, they're doing their homework, they're doing their research on it. Yeah, yeah. But then again, you don't really see directly the value maybe uh, within the company or it's too difficult because it's not the core competency of the, of the companies and there's maybe other players. So uh, this makes it generally maybe difficult to just uh, try and go for things. Mm. Mm. Any questions, comments from the, from the audience? You're all thinking about that color dinner. So uh, a few of you, oh, sorry. Yeah, we're right in the front, thanks. <laughs> right here, Al, right in the middle. Cloud-based technology is just a technology. We're talking about the coordinated work or TMS system. I just want to know that in a point of view, so uh, what are the essential components in this, uh, this so-called uh, coordinated uh, working system? In the supply chain, we have uh, party A, party B, and even party C, party D. So according to your point of view, and no matter what kind of system we're using, what are some of the essential components in this in this system? So, what are some of the uh, some of the fundamental uh, norms that should be an essential part of this uh, system? That will be helpful for the selection of the future system. I, I represent Foul China's uh, purchase team in China. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, according to my personal point of view, yeah, I I, I, cloud-based technology is just a technology, and also we need some uh, standards in uh, in the in the process. Well, party A and party B, they're participants in the supply chain. We need to establish the same set of uh, rule of game, rules of game. If we uh, adhere to the same set of uh, rules of game, probably we, we don't have to use the cutting edge technology to, to achieve our target. So uh, all, all the parties must uh, abide by the same set of rules. That's my personal point of view. Anyone else want to add anything on that in terms of, okay, we'll, we'll go back to the audience. Good afternoon. My name is Wang Yi from the logistic department of uh, Chang'an Auto. My question is for Mr. Wang on the stage. Mr. Wang, during your presentation, you tell us uh, OBD and other model. I have uh, preliminary knowledge about OBD because OBD can be applied to the transportation of whole vehicle. But our technology department tells me that uh, so will will OBD uh, do some damages to the uh, to the to power batteries in the whole vehicle? The other question is for other speaker. I just uh, talked about the internet. Uh, which is uh, which is applied to uh, marine transportation. So, what is the specific? Uh, well, you raised a very good question. Are you from Chang'an, Mingsheng? Chang'an Ford. Chang'an Ford. I'm from the logistics department of Chang'an Ford. We had uh, some contact with uh, Chang'an Mingsheng. There are a total of four companies doing this kind of systems. I think uh, we're using a technology that is different from uh, the technology used by other three companies. We use, uh, you know, uh, bottom cells when it is charged. You can, you can charge uh, the bottom cells. Uh, one charge can sustain the use of 22 days. Uh, 
A little bit of a. Well, uh, the the that the bottom the, the bottom cells can sustain the whole vehicles for 22 days. For 22 days, if you remove the power batteries entirely out of uh, the vehicle, yeah, we use uh, marine satellite in 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 ocean shipment shipping. That's true. But when uh, the container car carrier is fully loaded with with containers, uh, sometimes uh, the signal is just blocked by these containers. So we need to set up an internet by ourselves. Internet by ourselves. We uh, need to find the guys who can receive the uh, satellite signals best, and we send all the uh, messages or, or, or all the information to the guy, and that guy or that equipment can have direct connect with the satellite. But uh, if you want to connect uh, each and every equipment on board the ships to the satellite, the cost is huge. So that's why we need to establish an, an, an internet systems on, on board the ship and then we just use one equipment to connect to the satellite. Thank you. Any other follow-up questions, points on that? Okay. Um, Mark, I wanted to ask you further. You talked a lot about training and, and, edu and kind of continuous education and development. Um, you know, you, know, you need soft skills, but you also need some hard skills. What are the kind of hard skills you think in logistics, your logistics team needs to adapt and understand better to kind of take advantage of digitalization or, 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 or get the most out of it? And, and you know, maybe the soft skills that kind of accompany that. I mean, I don't necessarily know if everyone's going to become software coders, um, but, but what are some of the, 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 the specific kind of hard skills you think they also need to develop? Uh, I think it's interesting because uh, it's only about talking about uh, when uh, the survey is done, it's only about soft skills. Mm. So I, I'm not sure what this hard skill means. <laughs> Maybe um, uh, you can take some pressures from the day, of day to day work. I'm not sure if, uh, uh, because there's no, uh, I, I'm not sure what is the definition for the for high school, but uh, if you think about for the certification and learning, yeah. uh, it's give you very solid uh, knowledge exp um, uh, from the supply chain point of view. So uh, uh, maybe that can call as called to be the high skills. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps Benedict, from your point of view, I mean, are you, do you see your team having to? You know what? What sort of new skills are you having to really bring in that maybe weren't weren't there before? Whether it's in the younger generation you're recruiting, or in fact retraining into into your current into current team. So for the hard skills, um, I often see that when we hire new people, uh, these people they're very experienced. They show like 10 years experience, but actually they have only one year experience, and they repeat it in different companies. So uh, I think one of the benefits would be, uh, as a hard skill, to really have these different experiences in different functions. So not just having an expert in warehousing, but having an expert who experienced transportation, warehousing, maybe also some kind of uh, logistics controlling, because then he understands the overall um, processes in logistics, and you get a truly logistics expert. Mm -hmm. And then um, I'm a strong believer in continuous uh, education, yeah? so I think it's, it's up to the individual itself yeah, to just um, stay updated on the market, yeah? maybe do some benchmarking on the market, see what other companies are doing. This would be the responsibility of the management to organize this yeah, and to enable this, but to, to really go out there and see um, what other industries are doing. Yeah? Today we talked about e-commerce, yeah? Um, yeah. so just go to a warehouse of uh, JD and look what's happening there, and yeah. then get back with this knowledge yeah, and maybe uh, think about what do I have to do to change something in my own company. Yeah. I yeah. think this is something that, that should be continuously going on and should be enabled within the companies. Mm. And Mr. Wang, do you think that the automotive logistics supply chain industry is, is sort of you know, ready for the, for the path that you laid out for this technology evolution? Um, you know, is, 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 is it 
training in the right way? Is it is it building up the right the right talent? Is it working with enough innovative companies and technology companies to to make this sort of happen and to benefit from it? Uh, Automotive logistics, uh, including the uh, OEMs, we have to take into consideration the rising labor cost in China. Uh, in the past 10 years, I, I don't think I need to enjoy the life, but right now I think I need to take some time to enjoy my life. I need to reduce the workload. I think this is a status quo in, in, in China. We have a full-fledged laws and, and regulations in China. The uh, remuneration of CMB packages in uh, China is, is very close to international standard. So we, we, we need to uh, introduce international standards in our life, not only in the work. In uh, automotive logistic and supply chain, I think uh, we are ready. And uh, we, we, we do need to find a systematic way to embrace new technology. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, questions from the audience? Sorry, it's a bit, bit bright here. OK. Um, it's come up a few times uh, about AI and, and perhaps the, th the threat to, to jobs and, and, and the status quo of the industry today. Uh, but in, within your companies, to what extent, particularly on the logistics, supply chain areas in which you work, is this being viewed with sort of fear or uh, as an opportunity to embrace? I mean, be, we, we see there's many studies that kind of have some scary statistics about what could happen over 20, 30 years, not just in a warehouse or a factory, but in you know, many people in this room as well, including journalists, you know, they want automated away too, so. Um, what's, what's sort of the view in your company though, or in your, your organizations? Maybe we'll start with you, Benedict. <clears throat> so, I think, uh, yes, the people, if, if the employees hear artificial intelligence, yeah, maybe the first thought is, yeah, or uh, am I going to be replaced by some system, yeah, in the end of the day? I think the question is more, um, how do we use artificial intelligence here to do a better job than we do today? And the, the potential to being replaced from uh, repeating work has been there always. It's not mm -hmm. coming to technology right now. Um, but I think yeah, we should rather use the technology um, to, to do a better job here and then in, enhance it in our daily jobs, more or less. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you agree or we have any? Yes, I think. Uh, so we can, I mean, people, for talented people can be released from the, some no, uh, not so much value added job to do some, uh, okay, to do some more innovation uh, instead of a repetitive kind of job. So this is what's the, the positive, the trends, yeah. so yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, one of the points that I thought was, was interesting, um, Benedict, that you brought up about the move to e-mobility and um, the sort of move from supplying individual components to a more complicated systems. I mean, one of the things that we see some studies about which show uh, that, that the EV is actually a more simplified supply chain in some ways because um, there are fewer components being assembled at the end. But if you, what you're saying kind of tends to reflect that the complexity actually moves from the factory or the assembly factory, perhaps to the tier supply chain, would that be kind of an accurate assessment of some ways? And is that is that leading to perhaps a, a potential big shift in the way um, the, the shape of the supply chain that, that we see it today, or the, in the way that it, the logistics are organized? I see that uh, the requirements to logistics within the company are changing completely because we are we're going away from producing heavy dense products uh, towards very valuable uh, electronic systems uh, and with more complexity of course. So you have different requirements for the transportation itself in terms of safety possibly mm -hmm. and then maybe this is something where RFID technology comes in yeah, mm -hmm. because suddenly we want to track our containers and we want to know where they are at any time. And, then, and this is something that's changing. If, if you go from a traditional company away to, towards something new. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, 
probably wrap up soon, but if, if, if the audience, anyone have any further kind of questions they want to add? I mean, another one from, from my side, because uh, Mr. Wong brought it up at the end, looking towards the future and, and potential of blockchain, blockchain technology. It's, it's become, over the last year, almost a ubiquitous sort of buzzword. I'm not sure if it's used as much as it's, if it's understood as much as it's used when it's spoken about, but perhaps if you can, if anyone reflect, are you starting to look at blockchain? Uh, are there any studies, trials, examples that, that you, you know, you, expectations about what it could mean in, in your operations? <coughs> perhaps we can start with you, Mark. Uh, so far, we don't have any applications uh, for blockchain. Um, uh, maybe we'll have some application uh, in future, but uh, it's still uh, it's under study. Yes, yeah. we don't have uh, for now. Yeah. So still, still learning and understanding what it yes. what it can mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I think generally with uh, like blockchain itself, I think Gartner once made this hype cycle. Yeah, there's there's a lot of trends. Yeah, and the hype is really big in the beginning, yeah, and everyone is talking yeah. about it, and everyone finds use cases how to do it. But in the end of the day, we find out there yeah, maybe it it's not that valuable in a company or it doesn't add really value to my operations. And maybe it still takes a while for manufacturing companies to identify where it really adds value to the company, um, as it's not a core competency again. Um, but we see a lot in logistics uh, um, where there's actually a need uh, for trust within the supply chain um, that mm. blockchain is being established. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and Mr. Wong, do you see uh, blockchain already um, having uses in the near future or starting to look into studies and with your customers or your, or, the, or your partners that you work with? Uh, I will give you uh, a recent uh, example of what Jack Ma is doing now, which has a lot to do with the blockchain. Actually, Jack Ma is trying the so-called ejection uh, uh, ejection technology of uh, automobiles by Jack Ma. So what is the main reason or rationale? Uh, so they have uh, do the coatings. The coating process per se can really talk to each other using some sensor machines. Or, for example, it can be a very really huge or serious traffic jam on the express road. And I may have some urgent issues to handle. For example, I have a sore throat, I have to go to the hospital. So very likely I will have to tell the previous cars to give way for me. But I'm not a policeman, so I don't have any right to tell others to give way for me, right? And they will not get my signal and I will not. So what can I do? I can really initiate uh, the blockchain technology. Of course, you will give the vote, uh, you give your money to do the exchange, right? OK, so I have opened a so-called green lane for me. Uh, the cars before me getting the signals uh, will be giving them away for me, and I will give the money to them. So this is the only example. Uh, so everything is not under study now, so uh, this is not open. Uh, it is not uh, available in the public domain because it is not so well sophisticated, not so matured. Uh, so back to my point. Indeed, we have some leading technologies, especially the soft technologies, for example, uh, the so-called China-US uh, trade war. Probably the sanctions on the chips might not be doing a lot of harm to us because that is not our advantage. But if you talk about software, for example, WeChat or uh, the express services in China or the uh, meal delivery services in China, so these are the soft powers. I'm sure these are the areas in which China will be the leader in the world because we have every reason to be the leader in these areas. So this is my opinion. Thank you. I mean, that's a very, I think, a, a good segue, actually, because, um, and perhaps for the others to comment on, in terms of using the, the, the local, regional, whatever you want to call it, skills of China, whether in software and startup scenes, you know, is this a market where you can see technology incubating that will be re relevant to your companies? Are you, are you, are you making efforts to, to reach out to some of these, these innovative firms, which, um, as Mr. Wang described, are actually, are actually really emerging here? Benedict, do you want to? Mm. Well, our company's headquarter in Germany is uh, not in a big city, actually. It's a, it's a rather small, uh, almost village, yeah? but uh, this small village has uh, our company, Puma and Adidas. Yeah? Um, but nevertheless, you don't have the same access to 
to startups like uh, if you have your office in Shanghai because uh, you're in the middle of the technology and uh, like we heard already, uh, um, there's many, many points where China is actually the leader in technology and having this access to these companies here yeah, to even to just get information and then think, uh, thinking about it, what does this mean for my company? This is uh, one very strategic advantage we have here in China. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great. Um, any, any last... Any last questions from the audience? And I think I won't. I won't leave you waiting any longer. We can. We can start to. We can start to probably wrap up. But uh, I want to first of all thank our panel for their presentations. I think there was a lot of a lot of foresight, a lot of a lot of look about the changes that are coming, but also the, some real examples of what was already happening now and things we can implement. So we will have the presentations available for you to download next week. So please do join me in thanking our, our panelists. And indeed, a thank you to all of our participants today. Uh, I think you know we we learned we learned, we talked about a great range of, of subjects, whether the the U.S.-China trade war, uh, whether the the pretty remarkable reform, which you know we, we know is happening now in the automotive space in terms of the, the joint venture changes or the, the you know, capitalization things that will change, um, all the technology that we're seeing come into China, and, and still beneath that, you know, six, seven, eight percent growth per year in a market which is far and away the biggest. So there's so many interesting ingredients here, there's so many interesting dynamics to, to talk about. Uh, we look forward to continuing those discussions in the sessions tomorrow, but right now as, as well when we, when we go to, uh, to the particularly interesting ingredients of a hot pot and, and hopefully you join us to, uh, to talk that through. I think the hot pot will also be quite good for any sore throats that are, that are still lingering as well, so uh, we look forward to, to, to that. Um, a couple of points before we break. We're talking a lot about change and, and, and evolution and new, new skills and, and new talent. And, and I, I want to signal some new talent uh, and evolution in our own company, actually, because uh, I think that that's pretty important. Um, most of you, if you do know me, you've known me as the editor of Automotive Logistics and Finnish Vehicle Logistics for the past seven, eight years or something like that. Um, I've actually changed roles a little bit. I'm, I'm working across all of the publications we have at our company, and that's not just in logistics, but also in, in IT and in manufacturing and in design. Um, but, but so in doing that, we, we, we have a new editor, and uh, she's here with us today, Joanne Perry, who is sat right here on the, on the third row. If Joanne perhaps can just sell it, yeah, wave and say hello. Yes. <laughs> so I was one, it's important for me that you, you know who Joanne is because you know, we always want to hear stories, we want to hear story ideas, we want to hear your suggestions, we want to connect with you, and Joanne is now leading, leading the, the publications and the website along with, with her team, including Marcus Williams, who's here um, at the conference as well. Um, they, they, might, they can still turn to me for some advice and resource, I hope sometimes, but, uh, but that's obviously important to me that you, you, you get to know her as well. Um, I won't be going, disappearing quite either, so I look forward to continuing to work with, with all of you. And um, um, yeah, so, so and, and then I guess the other thing I wanted to mention that our gala dinner tonight is hosted by Changju Logistics, our premier sponsor. So many, many thanks to them. We are going to have a speech, a short speech, maybe about 80 minutes, 150 slides or something like that, uh, from, from Mr. Mr. Bo Siju, who's the, the, the founder and chairman of, of it. No, I mean, it'll just be a few minutes, but we look forward to, to hearing from Mr. Bo and, and you joining all of us. And as you sort of get ready and, and get your things together, we're gonna we're gonna play a video about the company just just as it's going. So enjoy that as it's playing, and bring your stuff obviously together. We'll have coaches departing downstairs in about 10 minutes time, starting in about 10 minutes time. So you've got a bit of time if you want to drop your bag off in your room, but do start to then make your way back downstairs to the to the to the front to the area where you come into the hotel, and we're gonna have buses uh, going directly to. To, uh, to our, our gala dinner. Um, if you're driving and you want uh, directions, go to the registration desk and pick them up there and pick up another panda pin if you haven't already. And uh, we look forward to, to seeing, you, seeing you tonight and continuing the discussion tomorrow. Shishir. <laughs>